right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Stephanie Pedrosa, Marketing Manager at Orego Software Technologies. And I want to thank everyone for joining us in Orego's webinar series. And in today's webinar, public agency experts will share their current organizational structures and discuss lessons they have learned around team collaboration and how their org structure helps them with their overall strategy. Orego has been helping capital owners manage their infrastructure programs for about two decades now. And we understand how important it is to have a successful org structure in your agency in order to deliver your capital programs efficiently. And with that being said, I wanna take the time to invite you to our upcoming webinar on Tuesday, November 9th at 12 p.m. Central, where the city of Las Vegas will share how, they have, how they're automating their CIP planning and delivery. Now, a few quick notes before we get started. The webinar will be recorded and we will provide all registered participants with the recording. The slides will also be provided to all registered participants. And if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit them through in the Q&A chat box. It's right there below. And we will answer questions at the end of the presentation. If we don't answer all the questions during the available time, we will follow up with you via email. And joining me today is my colleague and marketing director, Richard Kramer. Richard, welcome. Good afternoon, Stephanie. Great to be here. Awesome. And before we get started, we're going to launch a quick poll just to get to know who our audience is. So let me find the poll. All right. So if you can please take a time and just we want to get to know who's in our audience. You have the option of project manager, capital planning, finance, consultant, administration, other. Okay. Interesting. Okay, I'm gonna give it a couple more minutes. Great, very interesting. Hmm. Looks like at least half our audience on the uh, administration side, which is great and makes sense given the topic. Yeah. Hmm. All right, well, I'll end the poll now. You guys want to see? All yeah. Right. So we said, like we said, about half in administration, we have a few project managers and a few folks identifying them as selves as other. The other choices were capital planning, finance, and consultant. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, now I'll introduce our panel of experts. And joining us today, we have Carlos Braceros, the executive director of the Utah Department of Transportation, who has over three decades of experience in the transportation department. He currently serves as a chair at the Ashto Design Subcommittee, amongst other committees. He worked on the Legacy Parkway I-15 North project, where he was responsible for the development of the environmental documents, design build contracts, and construction of both facilities. Carlos, thank you for joining us. And next we have Doe Ross, the Deputy General Manager of Engineering for Las Vegas Valley Water District and Southern Nevada Water Authority, with over two decades of experience working as an engineer professional in the utility industry. She oversees engineering infrastructure management, customer care and field service departments, where she helps execute capital program delivery. Doe, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And finally, we have Tim Pratt, technology manager in the local and state government with over 40 years of experience implementing, supporting, and enhancing numerous solutions, including enterprise content management systems, CAD modeling applications, GIS and capital improvement projects, and support systems. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. And now I'll hand it over to Richard Kramer. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, the purpose of our uh, webinar series is really to facilitate learning and sharing opportunities in the capital owner community, particularly in, in the public sector. One of the things we hear from owners, our, our, our customers, our prospects, our, our partners of you know, engineering and program management firms that we work with, uh, is the need for information, examples on the sort of business management uh, side. So how do you build a high-performing team, a 
build a high-performing agency that can really deliver uh, the best infrastructure and facilities for your constituents. And this was really the genesis of, of our discussion today. Uh, organizational structure in particular is, is an interesting topic because it really underpins everything else that you do. Uh, the, uh, the bullets you can see on your screen right now were uh, taken from a study that was conducted at uh, the University of North Texas in Denton, which is in the Dallas area, uh, a few years back, which was particularly on uh, uh, public agencies, actually. And these are the kind of things we want to cover uh, in our discussion today with our panel. So how do you set up the right structure? How do you define goals, work together effectively, uh, and so on? Uh, so let's dive in uh, with our first panelist, uh, Carlos from uh, Utah DOT. Uh, before we, I do that, though, I just want to explain, we're going to have two rounds. So in the first round, I'm going to ask each panelist just to introduce uh, their org chart, talk about where they fit into it, uh, and how the structure sort of came to be, uh, and how it's, how it's working. And then we'll do a second round uh, where we go through, uh, and I'll ask the panelists questions on uh, you know, communication and um, uh, goal setting and those kind of things. So there's a couple more uh, specific topics. So let me uh, switch to the next slide. And here you have the uh, org structure for Utah DOT. So Carlos, take it away. Well, thank you, Richard and Stephanie, for this opportunity. And to all of you that are online participating, thank you for your time. It's uh, it's a pleasure to spend a few minutes with you. So um, this is the present organizational chart for the Utah Department of Transportation, what you would typically describe as a hierarchy type of organizational chart. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that versus a matrix organization, really in terms of how we operate as an organization. Uh, my position is as executive director and our department, uh, like every other department of transportation and usually most public agencies, we're set up to deliver capital projects, but we're also set up to operate a transportation system and to maintain a transportation system, as well as we have regulatory authority in areas like motor carriers and operating ports of entry and uh, various other functions. So when you look at an org chart like this, this is a very high level organization chart, basically just showing what we, we call our senior leaders. Um, these are all appointed positions. So um, th the merit positions within our organization fall within this. Um, we are structured for capital delivery. We made the conscious decision back in the early 90s when we went through a major reorganization uh, that um, instead of focusing, we had the choice between um, really optimizing the project delivery function. And to do that, we figured the best way to do that would be to centralize all our design functions um, versus customer service, customer focus. And we made the decision back in the 90s that we would decentralize. So we are a decentralized organization. And if you look on the left side of the org chart, you can see um, the regions. We have four regions uh, within each region. Um, that is where our primary uh, delivery system is uh, for the design and the construction of our CapEx projects, as well as the operation at, at the maintenance level takes place there. Um, the chair, the uh, organization has gone through various um, mutations um, over the years. In fact, the legislature um, created a new deputy director position. You can see the deputy director for planning and investment sitting there second from your, uh, from your left um, and really taking that um, a higher focus on planning and long range planning. Utah is over the last 10 years, the fastest growing state in the country. Growth is our biggest challenge. Uh, I like to remind people it can be an opportunity if we do it correctly. Uh, so a much higher level on planning, um, both within our metropolitan planning organizations that we have for them in the state, but also in rural Utah as well, and helping to develop, making sure that we have the right projects in the next, in the 30 year long range plan. I wanna talk just a little bit about this idea of organizational chart because too many times you will find that a hierarchical organizational chart will actually get in the way and impede the uh, functioning of what you're trying to accomplish. So, you know, just like any transportation organization, you know, our mission 
is to enhance quality of life through transportation. We have very specific goals and DOTs have, I'll say this is very common to most, some will have a few other things, but you know, we have a safety goal, zero fatalities. We have a preservation goal of preserving the infrastructure. And then we have a mobility goal. And those are really the three goals that we have in an organization. That's what we're measured against. And so Richard, I'll stop there unless you want me to get it. I probably failed to answer most of your questions. So no, that was great. I do have a question though. So you mentioned the, you know, the creation of that new planning uh, organization. Where, where did that live um, before you made that change? And right. That new position? right, that's great, great question. So we had one deputy position. Uh, I actually served in that deputy position for 12 years before I moved into this position here um, about nine years ago. Um, and it was a it was a group, a, a division underneath that existing that deputy director, that one position. Okay. And so you have really now you have this deputy director for engineering and operations and the one for planning and investment. And so really all the money decisions uh, where the money, you know, what projects are picked, uh, how much money goes to those projects, that all happens in the deputy director for planning and investment. And then once it's the project is selected, then it goes, it's handed over to the engineering and operations side, and it's assigned to a project manager in each region. Each region will assign a project manager, grave, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from creation to grave for every project. And they then oversee in more of a matrix approach because they don't have any direct reports, but we put together project teams for each mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. And those would involve, you know, a hydraulics engineer, a, a geometrics engineer, a bridge engineer. And they're all reporting to different people in different organizations. But for that project, that's they're responsible for delivering that project. And that's what I talked about this idea of being flexible to be operating like a matrix organization mm. within a hierarchical organization. Uh, and also at the regions, every region has one what we call program manager. And mm -hmm. so the program manager is responsible for really the scope schedule budget on all of the projects within a region. So a region might have three, four billion dollars of projects in their five year plan. That program manager may, has project managers working for them who are then doing those, executing those individual projects. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I had another question because you, you mentioned kind of what, I guess what I call the strategic goals of, of the DOT, the mobility and so on. Who's responsible? Is that the same development folks that are setting those or is that done at kind of the leadership level? How do you come up with yeah. those strategic goals? Yeah, that's a great question. We came up with those at a leadership level. We worked with the legislature they're actually incorporated in state code, so they're part of the you know the law. In fact, this afternoon we'll be up at the one of our legislative committees. Every year we're re required to present basically the state of transportation, and we we report back against the results against those strategic goals. So mm. all of the money uh, we have a we have a uh, dynamic dashboard uh, that's live on our website that shows the results of those. Uh, um, this diff we have different strategies that align to different strategic goals, and that's what we report to the legislature. It's my report card to the governor. Mm -hmm. you know, when he says, how are you doing? We sit down and I go through those strategic goals. I said, you know, this is how many fatalities we have, serious crashes, our pavement conditions X, our bridge is this. And uh, so all of those are now, um, we advance them within our leadership team, but they've been adopted into state code. And it basically serves, that's the level that we communicate at the legislature and with our public. Mm -hmm. How often do you have to report back? Is it like annually that you're reporting yeah. back? Yeah, great, great question. That? We have a requirement in law that we report at least once a year. And so, mm -hmm. but it tends to be where we start every presentation. We always like to drive people back and especially, you know, depending on the audience, but we like to drive them back to the conversation at where they can, I call it, have you know, being able to have the right policy lever to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so the conversation should always start with, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? What are the results we're getting? This, and we've met, you know, we can identify the inputs. So, you know, how many dollars went into this? How many mm -hmm. uh, people hours? How many machine, you know, equipment hours, all the different types of equipment, materials, whatever it might be. All of that are tied in as inputs in towards our strategies and, re and then they generate outcomes and those outcomes are what we talk about. 
Yeah. Excellent. All right. Thanks very much, Carlos. Let's switch over to uh, Tim and let's talk about City of Lincoln. Now, Tim, you were at City. I think you recently retired, but you were at City of Lincoln for 30 something years, I believe. Long time, right? 20 years. Uh, 21 okay. with the City of Lincoln. Um, okay. Hard to follow up Carlos, though, I'll tell you. He's very <laughs> thorough. Um, <laughs> Kind of on the left side of the, the chart, you kind of have the general overall uh, city structure. Uh, we're a strong mayoral city. I mean, there's no city manager. Um, and obviously uh, you'll see transportation utilities on the left side, kind of down the lower right part of that chart. Uh, many of you would probably call that public works and utilities. Uh, we changed the name here a few years ago. Uh, once you get in transportation utilities, uh, it kind of breaks down it into three different areas uh, where we actually have utilities, uh, water, wastewater, uh, includes uh, solid waste and also uh, stormwater. And then on the transportation side, as Carlos mentioned, also operational uh, for both of these. But on the, the transportation side, we have uh, what, what we would look at there is probably the project delivery. Uh, when you look at uh, the 20 years or so that I I was involved in the city, I came as a, a kind of an exercise in, in new management where uh, the former city engineer, which would have been like the assistant director for transportation equivalent now, had several deputy engineers and uh, they took like six or seven of those positions and consolidated it down to five managers. Uh, I was hired as the manager over uh, all the technology and uh, records. And uh, there was a gentleman for what we would call design and construction and uh, long range planning and uh, development work. Uh, it was quite an interesting uh, exercise and eventually kind of morphed into oh, kind of back to where it was, to be honest, over the years. Uh, just recently, um, with a lot of key retirements, changes in program, uh, the city has kind of gone from um, a time when the interstate was built and they hired a lot of those folks away from uh, DOTs, um, but they kind of tended to have uh, one person uh, run a project beginning to end. And there seemed to be some issues occasionally with project consistency, uh, having the same milestones, the same measurements, the same goals across all these projects. Mm -hmm. uh, so now um, the city is reorganizing. I would say they're not quite done. I think they're pretty close. They do the whole life cycle of uh, projects, which is basically you start with asset management, then you kind of go to a planning stage, then a design stage, a construction stage, and uh, then a verification stage, I like to call, and then back to asset management. Asset management, of course, is the preservation and operation of things. Uh, that's been a really key thing for uh, the city, especially as we get more and more projects, uh, very busy. Uh, on the municipal side with the city of Lincoln, uh, a lot of the projects are done internally, both all through the design stage and everything and delivery. And a lot of them are, uh, are done using consultants. And uh, frankly, one of the challenges I always had was many times somebody that would start as, a, as an employee ended up being a consultant or vice versa or changed two or three times. Uh, it is Lincoln, you know, it's, it's a fairly fine pool of people. Um, that, that's a good start. Um, mm -hmm. We get uh, basically our goals kind of set through the one in six program, which many DOT folks know much more than I do uh, in the metropolitan uh, area planning agency. And of course our capital improvement program. And in the city of Lincoln, uh, we do have some operating differences from like a DOT 
in that, uh, uh, first of all, the only person that can sign a contract or actually encumber money for the city over a, a very small amount is mayor. Okay. So, you know, we are absolutely customer citizen focused, but we also have to be very mayor focused because mayor approves everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other thing is the capital improvement program uh, is actually managed by our planning department, which is a whole other uh, organization of mm -hmm. not part of transportation utilities. One of the things that uh, I think the city of Lincoln and many cities struggle with is uh, you know, when I look at Carlos's chart, I, at least I would like to think that uh, within their needs, they kind of can control, you know, hey, we need, to, we need to bid this, we need to do that. Um, on the city side, it became very apparent that you absolutely had a great need to coordinate work because, uh, you know, there's just so many competing interests. As an example, I noticed in Carlos's chart that there was a right-of-way section. On many projects, we need you know right of easements, uh, easements, right of entry, uh, additional land. Uh, transportation utilities is not allowed to do that. It's part of uh, our urban development, folks. And there's two people, and that's all they do. And you know we can. Uh, without proper coordination and resource allocation, we've often overwhelmed those folks so much to where we've accidentally uh, not had proper right-of-way done, didn't have rights of entry uh, as projects were starting. Uh, I'm sure no one else ever had any problems like that. <laughs> right-of-way is a, yeah, is a lot. Of, it's, in my opinion, the most detail-orientated part of of the whole construction life cycle. It's just like so many tiny little. Well, well, Richard, can I jump on just yeah, that? Yeah, please do. It, it, is, it is absolutely the scariest power that government has mm. because we have the power to take people's property. And so it's, it's, it's detail by need, but it's also you have to be respectful of, you're trying to find the balance between you know, being fair to the public's value of how much you're going to spend for that property, but also being fair to that property owner. Right. I, I was a project manager 35 years ago, and I was trying to acquire a house, and I thought it was a simple deal. And I sat at the dinner table of this gentleman, and I was like, well, we're going to offer you fair value. What's the problem? And he took me to the door jam of his kitchen, and he showed me where all his children had been measured and they wrote the year and the kid's name there. And he says, this, you can't buy this with money. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when Tim talks about right away, it is by necessary, it's always at the back end of the process, mm -hmm. but it's also the, the most scary power we have. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. Yeah. Oh, you're fine. Mm -hmm. And it is, and, uh, I, I cannot think of a, a time uh, in my tenure with the city, except for one, and that was the biggest uh, project that the city of Lincoln did with five partners, uh, basically taking half of the city of Lincoln out of the floodplain. There was one house out of, I couldn't tell you how many thousand different things where we actually had to, actually had to kind of go to, go to court and actually do eminent domain. Uh, you know, sometimes I honestly think the citizens of Lincoln overpay for stuff because that you know they, they try to do it in a nice way. Uh, but mm. I'm the I'm the kind of computer technology geek. I don't have to get into that too much. But uh, we did make a lot of uh, accommodations on technology so that we made sure that you know project managers did not know any of the details of the right of way negotiations. Uh, you know, those numbers and that's all at arm's length and uh, secured from them until until at some point it's uh, appropriate. Yeah. So you mentioned one thing, Tim, that I just wanted to uh, drill down on a little bit. So and I think this is typical of a lot of city structures that 
um, you know, planning is done out, like you said, the planning department is sort of separate from uh, transportation and utilities. How, how does that process work when you're building the plan, trying to prioritize project? Is there a lot of back and forth between those two entities? Is it disjointed? Have the, has the city sort of figured out how to s smooth that over, that there's, there's two different groups of folks working on it? What do you that's, think? A, that's a very insightful question. I, I am happy to tell you that, uh, again, I was there 20 years. Uh, in my beginning, uh, we were like uh, putting cats and dogs in the room. Uh, and now it's a much, it's a cohesive effort. Uh, typically when we're working planning and CIP, you know, those projects are almost like six years out. So most of the project details, uh, the big picture items are already negotiated. When we actually get to the design phase and that it's pretty well, it's pretty well understood and accepted. A huge exception would be the uh, city of Lincoln had gone through a very, what I call innovative design concept uh, contest for a section of town that has a bunch of confusing streets and a huge amount of population growing every day trying to go through them and came up with this uh, concept of a double elevated roundabout. And, uh, uh, you know, they budgeted for about ready to start it and, uh, and you know, it, basically due to community discussion and uh, little value added engineering, they decided to just go back with some more conventional intersections. I think that project went, I don't quote me on the numbers, but from like 40 million down to 10. Um, okay, uh, interesting. Other, otherwise the project scopes and things are pretty well, pretty well defined, but the integration and cohesiveness between planning and LTU is, at an all-time high. Great. All right. Thanks, Tim. We'll come You're back welcome. to you in a little bit. Let's uh, move on to Las Vegas Valley Water and DOA. DOA, can you take us through your structure? Sure. Thank you. Uh, first, there's just a, a tiny bit of background. So we're actually three organizations in one. Um, first and foremost, we're the Southern Nevada Water Authority, which is the wholesale provider of water. We treat the water and deliver it wholesale to, um, to the different water utilities within Southern Nevada, as well as manage all the groundwater resources and so forth in the valley. Uh, the other organization being Las Vegas Valley Water District, which is one of the retail providers of water, uh, happen to be the largest. And then the third part is a, um, a preserve area called the Springs Preserve. So one thing that is interesting is that uh, Southern Nevada Water Authority was created much later than the Las Vegas Valley Water District. We're not actually a public utility. We're a political subdivision of the state of Nevada created by a special act under uh, Nevada Revised Statutes. And when SNWA was created, all of the other water agencies said, well, we don't have the staff to actually run this organization. There aren't any experts in water. So it was determined at that time that the Las Vegas Valley Water District's employees would serve as the employees of SNWA. So when gotcha. I say I wear a couple hats, I'm speaking mm -hmm. about that, but it plays into this organizational chart because originally when SNWA was created, there were separate groups of engineering, separate groups of operations, all that kind of stuff. And over the years, being that we are operating as one, but having to do two things, two different budget streams, we feel that it's a better use of our resources and finances actually to combine them. So here we have our current org chart and uh, we have our general manager who reports directly to the board of county commissioners. Um, below the general manager, we have our chief financial officer, our general counsel, and then the three deputy general managers, uh, one for engineering, which is myself, operations, and resources. And this particular org chart was actually kind of, we used to only have two deputy general managers and the general counsel. 
And then we decided let's make the CFO position as well as a third deputy general manager to split out the duties that are necessary. So within my organization, the capital improvement projects fall. So that's why I'm here speaking to you as opposed to others. Um, within engineering, we have customer care and field services, which is everything from the meter to dealing with the customers on the phone, interacting with that. But we also have a lot of infrastructure with respect to maintaining those facilities. And we have the only uh, test bench for, for large scale and small scale meters in the state of Nevada. So anybody who needs to calibrate their meter comes to us. But under engineering and infrastructure management is where anything to do with capital improvement happens. Those groups contain our engineering design division, our maintenance engineering division, our planning and engineering services division, our uh, survey and right of way, construction, uh, all of those folks. And so we have really three different ways of delivering our capital improvement projects. If we choose to do a project by design in-house, smaller project, maybe a faster turnaround, that's going to be done generally by our maintenance engineering group. And they are usually responding to almost immediate needs within that capital improvement plan to help facilities, operations, treatment, whatever it may be. Our engineering design division deals with much larger scale, longer programmatic type of capital improvement projects. And those are the ones that they're going to hire a consulting firm to help offset their staff to be able to do some of those longer term design reviews. And then the third area is in our planning and engineering services. Now their primary job is to receive plans, engineering plans that come from everybody else. Uh, public agency work, if they're doing a roadway project or a developer wants to build a new subdivision, doesn't matter. But we have the ability to execute agreements with the agency or with the developer to get some of our capital improvement projects done at the same time so we can reduce the amount of disruption to the driving public. So those are kind of the three ways we're able to deliver those. Great. I'll stop. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. So when, when was Southern Nevada Water created? Was it like 20 years ago, 10 years ago? Yeah, it was in the early 90s, yes. Okay. And it was actually it was actually created to really sort of take control and say, let's all speak collectively as one voice. Because what we had is we had City of Henderson, City of North Las Vegas, all these different users of water on the Colorado River, but we didn't have one collective voice speaking yeah. with the respect of the Colorado River Commission and all that. So SNWO is created to say, we as these water users of water of the Colorado River all have one collective voice for Southern Nevada, where we serve about 2.4 million residents and a 42 okay. million annual visitors. Okay, yeah. Um, and then you, you, so your does your lot does your um, planning services group under engineering? Do they do the long term planning, like putting the five year CIP together, or are they doing that as well? Yes, they actually do. Uh, it's it's really actually it involves a lot of people, but they generally are going to look ahead in conjunction with our water water resources group. But they're going to look ahead. We always have a fifty year plan of our resource. Okay. So we always know how much water and where our water's coming from for the next fifty years. But then within that, our planning and engineering services are kind of the eyes and ears to the development community. What's happening? Where? Where are the infrastructures, new infrastructure pieces needed? So they'll identify new pipelines, new pumping stations, reservoirs to serve the future. But also our asset management group will, will kind of go through and assess the condition of everything. And then our planning and engineering services folk keeps the whole hydraulic model of our entire system. So they know areas where we're not seeing adequate pressures or where we might need to do replacements or where they have the highest likelihood of failure. And they will go through and make recommendations and rankings, uh, portions of our, of our system saying these pipes need to be replaced, these pumps yeah. need to be replaced, and they'll plan it out 
far enough in, in advance that we can create a five or 10 year capital plan. Gotcha. So what is, that's interesting. So I would, what does infrastructure management do? Cause I would have thought infrastructure management is like managing the infrastructure that's in place. Are there is, explain to me. It's everything. What it, okay. Yeah. It's everything. So infrastructure management deals with the actual hydraulic model. So knowing mm -hmm. how much, how much pressures we have, our whole system is, is digitized in that manner to be able mm. to know, we know our quality of water at any given point, the pressures and flows available. However, they're also keeping in, in, in very close lockstep with the development community, which as you know, in Southern Nevada moves very fast. Mm -hmm. So they see what's being planned and sometimes it's being planned many years in, in advance so they can help to get those facilities in line ready to go as well as respond to the development community for more urgent things but they're also working in in conjunction with our asset management group which is, is assessing the existing infrastructure saying mm -hmm. what is reaching its 85 mm, percent useful life we should plan on replacing these pipes in this amount of time so they do a lot of that assessing both look ahead and look back and then make decisions for the now. Right, gotcha. All right, thank you. Um, let me go back a few slides to uh, Utah again. Um, and I have a couple of uh, questions for Carlos. Um, so Carlos, you have, is it like six folks reporting to you directly? Is that right? More or less? Yeah, that's uh, about right. How do you, I'm just curious, kind of how how often, just around like communication. How often do you meet? Do you meet? How do you meet with them? Do you do you like meet with them? Like I have a weekly meeting with my boss that I go over my goals with and things like that. How often do you meet with? Is it more ad hoc than that? Do you have regular meetings? And and how often do you meet as a leadership team, either that executive band or even the whole like all the divisional directors? Do you have like quarterly meetings? So tell me a little bit about that. Okay. Yeah. So. Um... We, we fairly well structured our, our meeting process. Our goal was to try to minimize meetings. Um, and every meeting should have purpose and outcomes and um, be focused. And so uh, the way you structure a meeting is important and identifying that outcome before you go into it so that everyone knows what's expected is important. Uh, my direct reports, I will sit down with them um, formally, what we call a, a staff meeting. We'll do that once a month for an hour, and it's a very focused conversation around specific items that you know we've we've vetted between ourselves what we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, the leadership team, which is you know the larger group, all the appointed people, um, we will meet once a month as well. Again, that's a two-hour meeting, and um, the deputies each have then um, they call it a deputy directors meeting. And they have more technical discussions during those meetings. But even at that meeting, at that deputy director's meeting, they're not talking about project delivery at that level. Project mm -hmm. delivery discussions take place between, you know, the specific deputy director and the region director on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, I will say the most constructive uh, communication is that that's going, it's constant. You know, so, you know, my two deputies are right outside the door. Uh, we've been in probably three or four different meetings today on multiple subjects, mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, you, the world moves too fast. Communication mm -hmm. is constant. And, uh, you know, I've been texting with one of them here. I hate to admit <laughs> it while we've been, been doing this webinar over an issue that's happening right now. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you go, there's a fire, you got to put the my, fire. My ADD. <laughs> right. Um, and then how, so you have, so the larger group's probably 15, 20 people, right? So you've probably got a couple of changes, like every year there's one or two. Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, oh, how, gosh. Do you, how do you decide? Um, I think most folks want to try to promote from within when it makes sense. How, how do you go through that process where you're deciding, hey, is there somebody available that we can promote from within versus, ah, no, we got to go outside and look for somebody. Yeah, and, and you know, that's not something you wait until somebody leaves. Um, you're constantly, your responsibility is constantly looking at succession planning and helping prepare people for those next steps and actually coaching people on, you know, the different 
places they need to be within the organization to allow them to get to a certain level of leadership. And so that's something that we focus on a lot. It's a continual work process. Um, in terms of whether or not we go within or not, um, most of them tend to come from within, but not all of them. For instance, I'm in the process now, my uh, CFO, financial officer is, is uh, retiring after a 32 year career. And I'm in the process of, I considered in and out and I'm down to my finalists are from outside the agency. Mm -hmm. So the goal is always to find the best person for the position. Mm -hmm. um, if we've done our job and prepared people within our organization, they tend to come from within. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then I had one more question. So one of the things we work with capital owners on as well is, is the, the part of the, the capital plan where you have to go, especially if you have federal money, you have to go and run it by the public and get public feedback before it can be approved. Is that your, is that, does that fall under sort of the engineering bucket or is that the, the strategic communications folks all the way on the right hand side there? Yeah, so uh, again, like we, we do operate in more of a matrix operation. So strategic com communication is our overall messaging and plans that, and uh, communications with the public that's taking place constantly. It's that ongoing conversation that we try to have at a community level. Um, but in the planning process, so under the Deputy Director for Planning Investment, in when we're doing the long range plan, that communication is happening with communities through that office there, and they bring in the appropriate region. So we had one yesterday in what we call the Uinta Basin. It's the Northeast part of, of Utah, a big mm -hmm. oil producing area of rural Utah. Um, so we're working on the next four year plan, the region, along with the, uh, the planning division out of the deputy director for planning investment, they were held all day meetings up in, in that part of the county. Now, once a project's identified and it gets assigned to a project manager, then, and it doesn't matter if it's federal money or state money, they all go through the same environmental and public process we've developed mm -hmm. uh, through rulemaking. So, you know, those of you that are familiar with, you've got, you've got law and then law gives the power of a state agency to create rules, which carry the power of law. We have put in rule what our public involvement process, and it's not dictating how to do it, but it's saying what the requirements are in mm -hmm. terms of how you engage in that conversation with the public, because you're using their money, you're impacting their community. They need to be part of the conversation to help make the decision with how you're gonna do that project. Yeah, absolutely. We, and yeah, we, we could have a whole webinar just on that, on that subject, actually. I'm absolutely. sure it's very important, especially, um, we've been talking a lot to folks and just with the, the COVID and the pandemic, how that's changed and become digital and that whole conversation. Very interesting. Um, all right. Thanks, Carlos. Um, so, Tim, let me uh, bring up your slide again. Um, and that's one second. Here we are. Um, and Tim, I, I wanted to ask you something as well, because you mentioned something. You said that the, you don't have a, a city manager. And I see a lot of, I don't know how long city managers have been around, but I feel like the last 15, 20 years, it's, it's, it's become a more, more prominent position. So does that mean you're, you, you just have a really hands-on mayor and your mayor is sort of taking that executive role, not just being a, a figurehead? Absolutely. Absolutely. My 10 year, uh, We've had mayors that were absolute uh, and, uh, you know, down in, in the last nuts and bolts. Uh, we had a long-term mayor, uh, ran, had many terms, and, you know, he, he would be on vacation cruising Alaska, and he would call the person in charge of wastewater and asking him about page 362 of the wastewater master plan. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it's it's different. You know, uh, current mayor is excellent. Yeah. Uh, she is on top of things, and she's also been on top of hiring excellent directors. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a different world, you know. Uh, one of the, I can remember uh, one of the things that I just have to get my my preaching out there. Uh, I'm a big proponent for electronic workflow. 
Mm-hmm. And in our case, our electronic workflow eventually feeds into our uh, enterprise content management system, which once the data and the forms and the information is in there meets all of our state records requirements. So, uh, you know, I, I can honestly remember uh, the look on some of my uh, uh fellow workers faces when they took a change order to a mayor uh the work's already done and say mayor we need you to approve this and mayor saying i won't Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to get really agile and make sure that we were getting these things approved quickly because of the type of uh, org org structure we have um, we, we were clocking, you know, a packet of papers, like a contract for a, a repaving or a water main. And, you know, they were averaging sometimes 22 to 25 days by the time they would go to, you know, to law, to finance, purchasing, and then go to mayor and come back. Uh, and occasionally you'd find one getting lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, all that's electronic now. The last uh, matrixes I had were somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five days to mayor's desk. I can't control when the mayor signs it, but uh, that's a vast improvement in speed, consistency. Uh, the documentation's there. It's all electronically signed. Uh, so I'll, I'll get off my soapbox for a little <laughs> bit. No, that's great. And um, yeah, we, 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 we've we been happy to help. Um, city of Lincoln in that regard it's the it's kind of funny I mean if there is a, I don't want to sound trite but if there is a silver lining in some ways to this to the pandemic it's how we've learned to adapt and I think one of the ways is that like electronic signatures are becoming more accepted now there was always I found you know even three years ago two three years ago there was more of a resistance to it um, in terms of well we just we just can't do it we need the wet signature those are the rules and that very much changed to, you know, sort of how can we get that done? How can we, and then that just facilitates automation of the, the whole process and makes things um, more efficient, which is, which is what we're, um, we're here for. Um, one more quick question um, I had for you, Tim. How did, they, how did they measure success? Like, so if you're, if you're an individual, whatever part of the, you're a project coordinator, project manager, you're a you're you know a, a property manager in the in in the property services or right away uh, outfit. Um, how do you how do you know whether you're doing a good job or not? I guess how do they set those goals for you and and give you feedback on that? Yeah, for us it's just basically been on time on budget. Um, you know, no no big fires. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's ha- has kind of a dual a dual edged sword that really needs to be looked at and thought about. Number one is uh, I think we could do a much better job celebrating our achievements with the community. Um, I worked for the school district prior to this. And, you know, one of the things that we really started doing was, you know, hey, we, we just finished this edition. Come see it. You know, hey, look at what money you've invested in the future of your children. And I think we do a bit of that, but I, I think we could do a lot better. Uh, the other other part of uh, goal, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, the the engineer minded people, you know, oh, we met the CIP, we got all the things checked off, life is good, we move on to the next, and it's just a cycle. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think sometimes we put away our fantastic work without uh, uh, showing it off much. Mm. That's a good. That is a good point as well. We yeah, I think we, we'll have to have you all back for a discussion on public engagement and um and how to uh, communicate all th- through the whole life cycle including at the end like you said and doing that celebration uh yeah thanks tim um doa same question to you so you have you have quite a big you have a large i mean i'm imagining your group is the largest out of those different columns right engineering i mean the way you describe it, it sounds like a lot of people how i guess how do you set goals for the folks that report to you and uh you know how do, how do they what, what how do you hold them accountable and set goals for them um okay well so i mean overall the organization we have uh just about 1250 uh, full-time employees and about mm-hmm. 406 of them are under 
my administration. Yeah. Uh, but I have three directors. So there's a director for each of those departments. I have three directors that report directly to me. The uh, the goals really, I mean, we do this annually anyway with them. We, we change the goals, we update them, but a lot of the goals are around um, anything that is obviously capital improvement driven, as well as certain initiatives that we might be undergoing. So for example, in our infrastructure management group, we've got some initiatives to try and streamline some of the way things are being handled digitally. We've been doing digital review of plans for, uh, gosh, 12 years now, I think. And, Mm -hmm. um, but we're always evolving and making things a little bit easier for, for our customers to, to work with us. So each year there will be new goals that will be agreed upon. And it's usually something that is tied to our strategic plan as well as our capital improvement uh, plans. Mm-hmm. The, the meeting the schedule, meeting the projects, complying with the budget, all of those things are in their normal everyday life. So it is something that is just built into all of their daily duties. So uh, it's really um, set up very smoothly. I mean, for example, even our engineering director will present the next projects that are moving forward and the prioritization of them are really based on our operational needs. Mm -hmm. So our engineering director is meeting with the director of operations or the director of treatment to say, which of these do you need first? When are they having to be done by and we have certain criteria because there are certain facilities that we can't shut down during the middle of summer for example so timing of the projects is very critical as well so there's a lot of continuous discussion amongst the departments the directors are all held responsible for their specific goals and portions of that capital improvement plan and then they report back to me uh, and i have Every other week, a meeting with all the directors, and then I have once a month, one-on-one meetings with the directors, and that's more to talk about any personnel issues they might have, or Mm -hmm, mm long-range goal plans, or, you know, they're always wanting to say, can I possibly get this position approved next, and, you know, whatever those conversations may be. And, um, and then we do have what we call senior management team meetings mm. every other month where all of the directors and the executive team, so everybody that you see there on that screen meets mm-hmm. together and kind of just go over what's happening, any special uh, things that need to be known. And this is for the executive team to download to all the directors major initiatives that are coming with legislation or Mm. uh, changes with the federal government, anything that's happening, we can download those initiatives and and concerns and and goals to those directors at the same time. So they hear it directly from the horse's mouth. Yeah, great. Wonderful. Thanks, Doa. All right, I wanted to leave sometimes, and I'm sorry, folks in the audience, I should have said this about 15 minutes ago. If you have any questions for our panelists, please, um, you have the, the, the chat window in your uh, little Zoom uh, control bar. Um, please uh, go ahead and, and ask them. And uh, I'm going to switch back uh, to Stephanie now for any audience questions. Yeah, so I guess this is more of like a generic question for everyone, but how do you think your current goals um, help or benefit your citizens or how do they affect them? So based on the org structure, how do your goals benefit your constituents or your citizens? And they didn't say specifically to who, so anyone can answer that. Go for it. Okay, so so we have 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 all our our quality of work framework that everything is supposed to align to. So our, you know, I talked about our strategic goals, that's what we do, but what we're trying to accomplish fits within this quality of life framework. And so, you know, we're trying to improve the health of our citizens. And we do that both through the typical safety measures, but also through things like, can we improve air quality? Can we provide more active transportation so that they can, you know, 
get healthier in that way. So health is one. The idea of connecting communities is another. How can we, through transportation, bring communities together? Because really, transportation should be connecting us. And historically, there's been cases where transportation has actually been used to separate people. You know, people of different social classes, whatever it might be. So connecting communities. The third one would be um, growing the economy. You know, are we providing access to opportunities for people? And then the other one was that mobility piece. Are we improving travel times? Are we improving reliability? Are we giving people options on how they get to where they want to get to, when they want to get there, such as transit, roadways, or active transportation? So those are the four things that our organization is, you know, that's what the public expects from us as a transportation agency. Would echo a similar discussion, uh, you know, uh, from when we onboard staff, uh, it's sometimes a shock to them to say that, you know, every citizen in the city of Lincoln and even sometimes even the greater county, uh, almost every second of every day is impacted by things you're going to do from, uh, you know, water to traffic to, you know, the traffic lights. Uh, we manage the solid waste. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an impressive amount of tasks, I'll tell you that. Thanks. And this is more along the right of way. I know, Carlos, you said that it took a long process. You guys did acquire that home, but it took a long process. I saw that in the chat. Um, on average, how long does it take to purchase a home from someone when you're doing a right-of-way process? And this can be for Tim or for Carlos, since both of y'all have worked in right-of-way. On the city side, I've seen it take uh, 30 months. And we weren't normally doing houses. It was more, mostly it was like a little corner of a lot or something like that. Yeah, I mean, there's a very prescribed process for right away. You know, so once once the engineering has been completed, gone through all the alternatives, determined that yes, we need to impact per private property. Um, you go through, then it goes through a process of um, determining the value, and then negotiating, and trying to get to yes, and trying to find that balance point of fair. Um, there's always a project schedule and we normally allocate, you know, let's say about six months to a year for right away, depending on how many properties, you know, we have some projects where we're acquiring a thousand parcels of property. Um, those are going to take more than a year. I've seen some individual property acquisitions where we'll, we're able to get right of entry and um, basically construct the project, but take 10 years before we finalize. Um, you know, whether it's through the court process or through negotiation. And so, you know, when you look at some projects and why is that still financially open, the project's been done for five, six years, it's because we're still resolving issues. And it could be, you know, right away issues, or it could be, you know, working with utility companies as well. Carlos, you mentioned utility companies. Those were the two gotchas that we really were working on when it came to uh, electronic workflow. Is one, of course, is a notification of the right of way staff right away and processing that. And they also was documentation of notification of utilities that they needed to vacate various parts of the right of way. Awesome. And then, final question What changes would all of you like to see in your current org structure that you haven't seen yet? Or are there any changes you'd like to see in your current org structure? And whoever wants, I'll start with you, Doa. Well, the, the fortunate situation is I, I was, um, actually our general manager tasked the three deputy general managers with deciding amongst ourselves the best organization <laughs> for us now. And that's how we ended up with what we have. So all of our wishes and hopes were actually incorporated into the final product that you see now. This wasn't the case, you know, 18 months ago. So um, what we were hoping for is what we now have. And sometimes if you ask our operations director, he jokes, be careful what you wish for, because now he has human resources, which every once in a while is a pain in his butt. But mm -hmm. it, 
overall, he's he's got he's got all the good stuff. Um, we don't have any real anticipated changes. The only thing we are looking to always do is to keep lines of communication open, and we don't we don't do silos. Uh, it used to be that way a long time ago, and and I once heard somebody say there there's no such thing as silos. There's cylinders of excellence, <laughs> but um, we we broke them all down. We are very fluid between all of our different groups, the DGMs, CFO. We are all fluid, and we all communicate very well. So my hope and goal for anybody out there is to ultimately end up in that situation. It took a long time to get us efficient this way, and we are there now. And our even our general manager says, this is the, the most efficient executive team I've ever had. And he's super happy because there's so much communication between all of us that there's no uh, boundaries. We, we step in each other's lanes all the time to help each other out. Thanks. And Carlos and Tim, do you guys want to share any changes? We have about two minutes left, so. Tim, you want to go first? Uh, I would just say uh, change in organizational change just seems to be a constant. Uh, I think as organizations evolve and work changes, uh, you have to adjust. Um, I think the city of Lincoln is going to be a little stagnant here for a little while because the assistant director for transportation position is vacant. Uh, uh, but I think that when that gets filled again, it might take off some more, but that's all I have. Yeah, I, I uh, anticipate constantly making changes. Um, we have the authority to you know, adjust as we need to. Our budget line items tend to restrict that, but our legislature, we have trust with our legislature and we can make those changes and they will then make the budget adjustments to allow the right, you know, the money to go to the right people. Um, we, um, the, I anticipate more and more identifying um, dotted lines on the organization. So like I said, we're, we're focused on uh, delivering and breaking down those silos, as Dora said. And so we, you know, identify matrix operations. So for example, our chief environmental engineer sits within our, you know, deputy directors or, uh, for planning and investment, but the execution of all the NEPA documents takes place at the regions. And so the technical responsibility for those NEPA documents go back in a dotted line to the chief environmental engineer, um, but the delivery of those projects is responsible to that region director. So the solid line is at the region, the dotted line is over to environmental and you have to be very clear about that. And you have to have very active communication to make those types of things work because people might feel like I've got two bosses, I'm being pulled apart. So it's, it provides the flexibility and adaptability to be successful, but it requires a commitment to be uh, over communicating. Awesome. Thanks. Well, that is all the questions that we can have for today. And I want to thank everyone for participating. Thank you for our panelists and have a great rest of the day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.